Okay, are we recording? It looks like we are. This is the last lecture from the data basics section. This is on robust versus non-robust statistics, and this should be, um, if not a short lecture, at least only part of it will require extreme uh, concentration. So we talked a little bit in some of the past lectures about robust versus non-robust statistics. Let's just reiterate what we've learned. Uh, I think this has been expressed in previous lectures, but I want to make sure it gets across very clearly. There are these standard statistics, which we could call non-robust. It's kind of hard to know what to call them because um, we've only been talking in, in the behavioral sciences about these robust and non-robust statistics for a couple of decades now, and before it was just statistics. I mean, the robust stuff existed, a lot of it did. Medians have been around forever, for instance, but we didn't uh, talk about them as much, I suppose, well, even though the statisticians were telling us to. We're very good at ignoring statisticians, apparently. So standard statistics, they work very well when the conditions are good. I think of them as high-performance race cars. If you have a nice, beautiful, smooth road, then they will get you from L.A. to New York in record time, as long as you have a beautiful, smooth road. Um, but when conditions are not good, these statistics break down, kind of like uh, ultra-low riding, ground effects, tuned-up McLaren F1 hitting a gigantic... Uh, pothole or going over a speed bump at 100 miles an hour. So very bad things happen. Now in statistics, very bad things mean you get wrong answers or biased answers or something like that. So they give you wrong answers when the conditions are not good. Robust statistics, on the other hand, they give accurate conditions in good or even very bad conditions. Now every kind of robust statistic has sort of its tolerance limits. There are incredibly bad situations where even the robust statistics break down and can't give you good information and people are constantly trying to invent new ways of making sense of that data. But in general, when you have bad data or data that's bad for standard statistics that doesn't meet the conditions, then you use robust statistics. Robust statistics are like um, a Humvee or a Ford, Ford Bronco or something like that that can crawl over a lot of things. It doesn't matter if it's got lumps and potholes and even mud in a river. It can make it just fine, but it's not going to go very fast. It's not going to do everything you want. It has limitations. So Robust statistics limitations are that they don't have these desirable properties for creating inferential statistical procedures. Because we're learning descriptive stats, mean, median, standard deviation, uh, variance, things like that. And some of these, especially the mean and the standard deviation and the variance, we're going to put those, we're going to kind of use those as building blocks to build uh, more complex procedures that are going to become inferential. And inferential statistics aren't just describing this, the sample in front of you, they're trying to use that sample to make guesses about what's going on with the population, which you don't actually see. So robust statistics don't have the properties that we need for that. And robust statistics tend not to be as sensitive, which means not as powerful. So if you're doing a study and you're really looking to see if there's a difference between the, the average values of two groups, you don't want to have to go to medians because medians are less likely to find that difference because a mean is much more sensitive. So we generally feel kind of bad and upset and angry and a little stabby when we find out that our, beta, our data don't fit uh, the conditions necessary for the regular non-robust statistics. So which are which? There you go. As far as we've learned so far, um, forget about the mode, forget about the range. You might think of them as robust stats, but we're just not going to use them very much. Uh, they're, not just, they're just not useful for very much uh, of what we want to do. So think of these statistics. So the standard statistics for center and spread are the mean and the standard deviation, um, and also you, the, the variance, but we don't use the variance to really describe data very often. We use it later, even though it's tightly related to the standard deviation. But think mean standard deviation. That's what you're going to use to describe um, the average, as I say, the center, or the spread, the variability of a data set, as long as you can use standard statistics. And then wrote the robust versions, if you can't use the mean, you use the median. And if you can't use the standard deviation, you use the interquartile range, the IQR. And there are all sorts of others that we're not going to learn about in this class, and I hope you guys are okay with that. So how do you decide which one to do? Well, you start with the standard statistics. You just assume, in most cases, that you're going to use the standard statistics, unless you happen to know beforehand that it's just not going to happen. Start with standard statistics. That's the default. And then you consider the conditions. Each, each statistical procedure that we know has some conditions that are required for using it. And so if the conditions are not met for that procedure, then you have to go to something more robust. So the conditions for the mean, the standard deviation, and the variance, because those are our regular non-robust statistics, and that's where we start. 
first of all, you have to have numerical data. And that might seem obvious at this point. I hope it's starting to seem a little obvious. But you can have ordinal data, and some people try and calculate means on purely ordinal, but you, you can't do that. As I've mentioned, you, could, you can treat um, the sum scores of a whole bunch of ordinal items if it's a validated and reliable scale that's been tested out empirically and you know it's going to work. You can use that as a numerical um, measure, and you can use those total scores. If every person has a total score, you can use all those total scores together as numerical, and so you can calculate means and standard deviations and variance on them most of the time. But the individual items, I strongly agree, strongly disagree, etc., you can't do that. You can't use numerical data. I mean, you can, but you'll get bad answers. You will be wrong a lot, and you'll be, you'll be making science cry, is what you'll be doing. So you need a more or less symmetrical distribution, because these things are all affected by skew and outliers. So look at a box plot. We'll learn later about a normal distribution, about um, a nice bell-shaped distribution, but you don't actually need that. You just need something even simpler. It just has to be uh, symmetrical. It can be one spike in the middle on a, on a histogram and both tails extending out in either direction, and that's just fine. Or it can be totally flat across like a purely uniform distribution where every value has the same number of individuals, etc. All those things are fine, as long as it's not asymmetrical left to right. So look at a box plot or a hist and then no extreme values, no very high or very low values, unless they make the whole distribution symmetrical. So you can have a symmetrical distribution that's bell-shaped, and actually those tails can go out very, very far to the right and left, to the high values and the low values. And so you can end up having some, what look like actually kind of uh, outlier or extreme values, but you'll have the same number on each side and they'll be in the same pattern on each side if it's a truly normal distribution. So everything remains symmetrical. So you can go ahead and keep using the mean, the standard deviation, the variance, that kind of thing. But very often when we have extreme values, it's just on one side and that sucks because that makes your data. Actually, I think it's cool, but it means you can't do certain things with it. So how much does this matter? And you should always ask yourselves, once you learn that there's a better way to do things and a worse way to do things, don't slip into the habit of saying, yes and no, it's always bad, it's always good, you can't do it, you can do it. I slip into saying that from time to time. When in fact, if you talk to statisticians, if you talk to experienced data analysts, what they would tell you is that sometimes it matters more than others. So sometimes bad data has is, oh great, yeah, I really should yeah, edit. Sometimes bad data is okay. So if you have a large sample size and only a very few outliers, those outliers aren't gonna affect very much. They're not gonna, what we worry about with outliers is that they will pull the mean in their direction and give us kind of a biased and wrong idea. They're, they're influencing too much. They're like rich people in a democracy who can basically buy themselves a law because they have so much money. So they get more influence than they should over what the mean is. And they get more influence than they should over what the standard deviation and the variance are. So they make those things too big and they make the mean too much in their direction. If they're high numbers, then the mean gets to be too high. If they're low, then the mean is too low. But if you have a large sample size, then those individual extreme values, they don't affect things very much. They have an effect, but it's washed out by all the other stuff that's not having problems. And if you have a very small amount of skew, that's not usually a very problem, a, a great problem. You'll sometimes hear, oh, there's my cat. I trust you might have heard that. You sometimes hear people say you can't use skewed data. Well, that's kind of silly because every sample you're ever going to see has some amount of skew. Skew is a number like the standard deviation or the variance or something that we can measure about a data set. And the way we do it is zero means no skew, and a positive value means positive skew, and a negative value means negative skew. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. You'll never find a pure zero skew because just weird stuff happens in your data. You get a random sample or a non-random sample, some stuff happened. And so it gets um, a, a little off to one side or the other. So the question is how much skew? And there are rules of thumb. Some people say you should worry about skew if it's more than plus one or less than minus one. Some people say one and a half. Some people say two. So that's kind of the range where people are concerned about skew. And then there's, you don't know about this yet, but there's this thing called the central limit theorem, where in some inferential statistics that we'll learn later on, it makes it so that really skewed and outlier -y type data, especially skewed data, doesn't actually cause us problems as long as we're doing certain inferential things. Um, descriptive stuff will kind of break down, but inferential stats will because of this theorem if you have a big sample size. So if you're wondering with which way you should do it, well, you've got a computer. Do it both ways, and you hope that it's 
either really obvious that you should do it one way or really obvious that you should do it another way. Sometimes maybe in limbo there, but do it both ways and see what happens. Sometimes a very little effect, so I'm saying sometimes bad data has very little effect. Well, sometimes that little effect is very important. So you got to think about what you're studying. What are the consequences of being a little bit wrong? If you're just doing an exploratory study and you're not expecting to find anything super particular, maybe there's no money writing on this, maybe there's no one's career writing on this, nobody's health is writing on it, you're just kind of curious, you're just going to publish a small study in a low prestige journal, or your boss just says, collect some data and see if the therapists are basically satisfied with their working conditions or something like this, and you're not really concerned about being wrong very much, fine, have some kind of bad data. You still don't want insanely bad data, but some kind of bad data. It won't make you wrong too much. It won't make it enough wrong that you'll care. But let's say you're trying to decide whether this treatment for Ebola is going to be better than the last treatment for Ebola, and if it is, it'll save 5% more Ebola patients, but 1% more of them will die from the treatment. I mean, these kinds of decisions are really critical and really scary, and then that little bit of effect becomes critical. Then you really cons you really worry about very small problems with your data, very small numbers of outliers, very slight skew, asymmetry, stuff like that. So for the rest of this lecture, um, we've got about eight more slides, seven or eight more slides, something like that. I'm just going to show you some, some box plots and some histograms and talk a little bit about how bad things are when there is skew. So here's the emotional intimacy scale, which is this questionnaire about how close you are to your mom and dad. I gave it to a bunch of people, and uh, it was a lot of people. It was over 400 individuals at, a, at another university. It's seriously skewed. The skew is negative 1.6. So a lot of people would say, negative one, positive one. We're getting into scary range once you get outside that range. So you should do something about this. So how bad is this? Well, you can tell what the, the median is. It's the dark line on the uh, box plot, but the mean is down there. So most people report a lot of closeness and emotional uh, kind of bonding with their mom and dad. Actually, I think this is the mom version. Most people report being very, very close to their mom. A very few people report being insanely close to their mom, which is so maybe. Um, but then the median is way up here near the top of the scale. I think it only goes up to about 27. And then from here on down, there are fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer until you get all these uh, extreme observations. But these extreme observations seem to fit this pattern. It's tapering off very gradually. And so you, this is a, a highly skewed distribution. You would say this is negatively skewed because we talked about the direction of skew. The direction of the thin tail of data is the direction of the skew which seems backwards, because all the data is up here on the positive side. Yeah, thanks, Kat. Do you want to come say hi? Well, all the data is up here on the positive side, um, but the tail is the direction that we say the skew is in. It's just kind of a convention. You kind of have to get used to it. Now, in this case, this difference of um, two to three points, that's a big enough difference that that could make or break of an effect you're looking for. If you're studying something, that difference with a large number of subjects could definitely be bigger than the effect you're actually looking for if you're comparing, you know, men versus women or something like that. So that's that's concerning. That skew is big enough to cause some serious difference between the mean and the median. So you should use the median, and then you have to use a whole different kind of statistics for comparisons. So the number of children, I asked these same people um, how many children they had, and the people who had children, there were, um, I think, around 100 of them or so. And it was incredibly symmetrical. I don't know why. I imagined it would be skewed negatively as well, but this particular group, on average, they had two children, and that's the mean and the median are within just a very, very tiny fraction of each other. Right They're both two. It's like two and 2.003 or something like that. It's very, very similar. So when things are this symmetrical, you don't really worry. Everything's fine. Here is some worrisome skew. This is the, the decision time. If you've taken one of the quizzes, you've seen this chart. Um, so this skew here, both of these distributions are skewed to about the same extent. Both of them are skewed about negative one. So kind of on the borderline of where we should get worried. I probably don't want to analyze these using parametric stats and then try and, well, regular stats and then try and uh, report that in a journal article, which I still haven't done yet. I probably have to do something to the data or use different kind of statistics. And here's GPA, and this is um, about the same skew, negative 0.8, and let's see what that does to the central tendency. So the median is 3.4 and the mean is 3.3. So from a practical standpoint, ask yourself, how upset would you be if your GPA dropped from 3.4 to 3.3 for no reason? How happy would you be if it raised from 3.3 to 3.4? My suggestion is this is not probably 
a massive difference, but it probably does matter. There could be some uh, research effects where this difference of 0.1 in GPA points would matter. It, and so we probably want to deal with that skew maybe before we move forward. I mean, this, this isn't bad, though. This isn't outside that negative 1, positive 1 range, even though you can definitely see the skew in that graph. Um, here's that graph you saw before with student height. It's fairly symmetrical, except for those two extremely short people. They were both women, as I recall. They were in my class. There were about 40 people. So these two data points will probably affect the mean. They'll pull the mean down a little bit because there aren't very many. Well, 40 is decent, but there, there aren't you know, hundreds of people to offset their, their negative effects and pulling the average down, uh, the mean down towards them. So it's probably going to be a small but noticeable effect that those two outliers have. So in this data set, you should probably start considering whether you should get rid of the outliers. And if not, then should you consider different kinds of stats to your data, not the standard kind. Here's some SAT math scores. The N is 130, which is kind of in the big range for social sciences, but not so big that it can withstand any kind of craziness. A very mild scale, negative 0 0.2. So that made a difference of four points on the SAT score. And the SAT range is actually 700 points. Actually, I believe this is probably students being very confused. I think maybe you're only supposed to be 800. I should put the data. So students probably didn't remember what the SAT was. Kind of makes me wonder if they remember anything. Maybe they all lied about their SAT scores. Anyway, assuming this is accurate, um, the, the skew is very slight. And actually, the skew this is negatively skewed, even though that's hard to see. Now, over here, it looks like there's more stuff right in the median, but over here, all total, look at how long this whisker is compared to this whisker. It's actually a negative skew. It's kind of a lumpy, weird distribution when you look at the history. So here's a histogram of something else. This is those same individuals, their self-reported GPA. You can see that this is negatively skewed, as GPA tends to be. And then there's one extreme observation, one outlier, 1.0. Um, everybody else has something above 1.5, so, and, and a lot of piling up around the B range, about 3.0 is the most common reported thing. Well, even with this uh, noticeable skew, it's not much. It's negative 0 0.3, and then that one outlier, we might consider removing that person. Maybe they didn't understand the instructions or something. We'd have to think about that. But the mean is 3.03, the median is 3.0. There's very little difference here. This is... This is a very subtle difference. So I wouldn't worry about this one. The skew is negative 0.3. It's well within the negative 1, positive 1 range. You're probably fine. Now here, skew is really bad. I asked some undergrads at Ohio State a few years ago how many sex offenders they had personally known. The undergrad who had known the most said that he or she had known 10. And then you had 6 and 5 and 4. Um, the mode is definitely 0. And now in a data set like this, looking at the mode actually makes some sense. You can say the mode is 0, and that tells you something. that. Um, the most common number of sex offenders that undergraduates have known is zero. And because of this skew, the skew is 3.4, positive 3.4. Because of this skew, you get two very different answers. You could say the average undergrad undergraduate has known about one sex offender. But that doesn't really fit, does it? Because far more than half of the entire data set is on this zero point. You sometimes get data that's like this with tons of zeros. Anything where you're counting something that's not very common, this happens. they counting the number of sex offenders. So far more than half of the undergrads were zero. So it's kind of silly to say that the average was one. You imagine that most of the people you pass, or half the people you pass, will have been one sex offender, or half of them will know two, and some of them will know zero, and some of them will know one. No, because that the mean is being very, very misleading. The better average is zero. On average, people have known zero. But I asked the same question of APA therapists, people who work for the American Psychological Association. Uh, and there were just under 100 of them, 87. This is their distribution. This is this is horrible. <laughs> this is just it just makes me laugh. It's so bad. Now you still got the zeros. Almost seventy of these eighty-seven therapists said they have known zero sex offenders personally. So most of these therapists are not working with sex offenders. Maybe they're not working with criminal populations at all. But then as you go up, you've got a few people here who have known one, two, three, four, five, you know, ten, twenty, and you for some reason you've got this spike of four or five people who have known exactly this number, which is like 100. Maybe there was just an easy number to round off to when I asked them to fill in the form. Then this person who claims they've known 500, and this person who claims they've known 1,000. 
Now, if you work with sex offender, that's that's totally reasonable. You might work with a thousand sex offenders over the course of a few years of your career, like 10 years, 20 years. It's completely realistic. But man, this is awful. So if we look at the measures of central tendency, the mean is 28 and the median is zero. Now keep in mind, uh, seven out of nine, essentially, about seven out of nine therapists. So how is that like 80% or something? Uh, anyway, a lot. The vast majority of therapists have never personally known a sex offender that they know of. Everybody's probably known a sex offender, you just didn't know who it was. But they've, um, the vast majority of them got zero. And the median gives you a really good idea of that. So the average of this is zero. That's why you use the median in skewed data sets. This average is zero, and that makes sense. The mean, however, is 28. So a person who like, didn't know what they were doing might say, on average, APA therapists, the average APA therapist has known 28 sex offenders personally. Now, mathematically, yeah, you can make a case for that because you calculated the mean, but if you know anything about just basic descriptive statistics, you could never calculate a mean on this data. Look at how horrible it is. The skew is actually close to seven. That's just insane. That's crazy. So I'm going to stop there. I hope you've kind of got an idea of when to use robust statistics, what they are, and how to think about whether it matters and how much it matters, whether you make those decisions.